now. Hello, everybody. Hello. I am thrilled with Carolyn to present to you someone, if you don't know Paul Levy's work, well, you have something absolutely thrilling to discover. When Carolyn and I were writing Radical Regeneration, we found ourselves diving again and again into our, two of our favorite books, both by Paul, Quantum Physics, which is quite simply the most dazzling, the most brilliant book ever written about the deep relationship between the discoveries of quantum physics and deep spirituality. It's an absolutely amazing book. I've read it four times. I've given it to everybody I know, and I'm going to collect my your royalties from you, Paul. Right. The other book that we really mined again and again for our own benefit and also for the benefit of the book was Dispelling Wetiko. So when we finished the book, we were sitting around exhausted and said, who would we most like of all the major teachers now to really write one hell of an introduction to this book, which is the distillation of our life's work? Mm -hmm. And both of us said, Paul. Levy. So we contacted Paul and very graciously, he said yes. And then we expected a two page wonderful introduction, but Paul wrote an absolute masterpiece mm -hmm. of an introduction, which is one of the greatest honors I think that both of us have ever been paid. So Paul, thank you, welcome. Yes, thank How you. lovely to see you and be with you. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you guys. So really just can't thank you enough for the invite. Let's plunge in and ask you about this word, Wetiko. Yeah, yeah. Because this has been so much your focus. You've just finished another book on Wetiko. Yeah. How did you discover this concept and why did it burst open your mind? Your, I, don't, I can't call yeah, you yeah. the orchestra of your mind. Whatever the hell is in you, this multiple. Right being that is writing these works for us. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. It's a great question. And basically, so I had personally gone through this incredible trauma where I had, um, in a sense, just to um, really cut right to the chase, just had a direct encounter with archetypal evil. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the story about it, um, but the salient point is that I began to have the recognition that it wasn't just, you know, it was in my family of origin through my father, but then I began to realize, wow, the same evil energy, and it, it was not a personal evil, it was an archetypal transpersonal evil, that it was coming, it was coming through the field in all these different, you know, sort of um, these ways. And at a certain point, I began to really understand, wow, this is really important. I was really beginning to see something and it was as if something was um, through the manifestation of that darkness that was, you know, it totally destroyed my family. It almost killed me. It almost drove me crazy. But actually something was being shown to me. I was somehow was able to, to establish myself in that viewpoint. And so then sort of like this person who had come across a new country who was making a map, I began to, you know, track it. And... Um, and, that, and at that point, I wasn't even aware of the word Watiko. It was only a number of years later where I came across a book, um, Columbus and Other Cannibals, that <laughs> where this indigenous scholar, Forbes, Jack Forbes, introduced the term. And I realized, oh my God, this totally maps on to what I had been experiencing. And um, so that was really the doorway um, into how I discovered my work. And once I discovered my work, it really connected me with being creative, with my creative voice. If I hadn't connected with my voice, with, my, with that creative spirit that all of us interface with, but if I hadn't really gotten in an in intimate connection with that, I would have been in deep trouble. So I was basically devoted the rest of my life to really unfolding and articulating this idea of Watiko because it's at the bottom. It's, it's this, this virus of the mind, you could say, you could conceive of it in that way. Like the coronavirus is a physical virus. Well, the coronavirus is this 
sort of lower level emanation of the higher dimensional virus of the mind called Watiko. And I can explain that, but this, this mind virus is at the root of, of the madness that we're playing out um, collectively in the greater body politic of the world. And um, you know what I'm basically saying is that the source of the madness, the source of the evil that's playing out is to be found within our psyche. And people think what a radical idea, a mind virus, a parasite of the mind. But in essence, I think we all agree there is a collective psychosis going on that our species has fallen into when acting out an amazing insanity on the world stage. And I'm basically pointing out through the Watiko idea, you can understand that, oh yeah, the origin and the source and the solution of that madness is to be found inside of our psyche. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, in in radical regeneration, uh, we, <clears throat> you know, the subtitle is birthing the new human in the age of extinction. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, we encountered, as as you have, I'm sure, is um, a lot of fatalism around. Well, we're screwed. That's it. Um, we're going to all become extinct. Blah right. blah. blah. And um, that may be true. You know, we would be the first to say that's really possible the way we're going. Right. And um, we were enchanted with uh, the quantum revelation that right. you wrote <coughs> in terms of the field of possibilities. Right. And so, you know, we just said, well, you know, it's possible that humanity will mostly be destroyed. There may be pockets of people who survive. And, you know, we just raised the question, what would their lives be like? And what might they become? And we also are looking in this book at the birth of a new human species. Right. And is there a possibility of a mutation into a new human species through the horrible ordeal of collapse of you know climate catastrophe or whatever through Wetiko. And uh, wonder if you'd talk a little bit about the field of possibilities. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, that I just love that that contemplation because you know, um, so I'm not a physicist, but I'm just a really curious person. And then you know, I've had this experience a number of years ago. Um where I began to really have the recognition that this is a collective dream and, and I began to really experience that and step into that. And then I found quantum physics and I, and I had the realization, wow, this, the quantum physicists had discovered the same thing, but from the scientific point of view and just in a simple way I can explain, you see, because if we fall into pessimism and there's all the evidence to confirm feeling pessimistic and filled with despair and depressed and helpless, but if we fall into that, I point out, well, that's the fall under the mind virus. That's the fall under the thrall of Wotiko because being like a dream, if we're holding a point of view, we're gonna then draw evidence confirming our point of view. And the more evidence we attract, then the more entrenched we are in that point of view. And it's a feedback loop whose origin is our own mind. And the, and the trophy that we win is that we're screwed if we fall into that <laughs> yes. point of view. So there's something that's wrong with that, that logic. Now here comes quantum physics and quantum physics in essence is saying, well, uh, um, I guess the, the first thing to make uh, to establish is that the, the founding fathers discovered that this, this, this world, this universe is quantum on all scales. It's quantum through and through. So it started out as the exploration of what, is the, what are the building blocks of this physical world? And, um, you know, they really just kept on going down and down into different, you know, the microstructure of the universe. And then at a certain point, they didn't find anything that was physical, they found consciousness, but th that's a whole other story. But the point is, is that this whole cosmos is made of what are called quantum entities. And quantum entities are very, very interesting because they don't exist in actual, in a physical form that what quantum physics basically discovered is that, you see, before quantum physics came along the scene, classical physicists were thinking that this, this world objectively existed separate from us, and we were just passively in the role of observing it, trying to understand how it worked. 
quantum physics comes along and it says, well, there is no such, no such world. If you're thinking there's an objective, you know, this world separate from yourself, you're, that's nonsense. There is no such thing. Quantum physics empirically proved that. On top of that, it actually pointed out that the act of observing the world actually influenced the world observed. That's just like a dream, I, I should point out. So the way we're observing that the act of observation is creative, okay? That we have this incredible creative power. Every moment, we're creating our experience of ourselves and of the world each and every moment. But it even gets more far out than that because these quantum <laughs> entities are basically, they don't exist in physical form. They exist in a state of, of any and every potentiality they could ever exist in. That's the state a quantum entity exists in up until we observe it. The moment we observe the quantum entity, it actualizes into a particular form. All the other possibilities just, just dissolve as if they didn't exist. They go into parallel worlds. And that actualized form, that's the world we experience in physical, in the physical dimension. Now, quantum physics has proven that. What that means is as follows, because here's where it gets mind blowing is that any and every of those, those possibilities, those potentialities, quantum physics is saying, even if one of them, which is highly ridiculously unlikely, that could be the one that manifests this very moment. So to bring that back into our situation, that is to say that, yeah, we have all the evidence we need that, oh, you know, doom and gloom and we're screwed and we're destroying ourselves. And quantum physics comes in and says, well, there is a possibility that your species, that, that our species might actually, that enough of us might actually awaken in time such that that non-locally will, will affect the entire field and that, that all of our species can actually experience some form of expansion of consciousness and awaken in time to avert the impending catastrophe that we ourselves are creating. Quantum physics is saying that that's actually a possibility. And I would add, so that's not some, that's not like new age woo woo theory. That's right. it's true. And if we're not imagining that, if we're not thinking that, then what in the world are we thinking? If we're caught by that pessimism in that self-created feedback loop, we're part of the problem. That's gonna actually like a self-fulfilling prophecy we're gonna invoke the very universe that's gonna to confirm to us the truth of our pessimism. But quantum physics is saying, if you're doing that, you're out of your mind. You're not in touch with reality. The reality is there is a, a possibility that we can actually awaken. And why not imagine that? Well, it's more than that. Sorry, Danny. Can I just, it's yeah, more than that in your book because you say one of the things that I have marveled at in your book is it is that you go beyond observation you talk about intention yeah. it's beyond observing reality it's have if we're in a dream a collective yeah, yeah. dream then the in more and more enlightened intention you bring to the dreaming of the dream the more the dream can transform itself in a way that aids the birth of a new humanity Right, right, because that, okay, I'm so glad you said that because that, it's not just like, oh yeah, this is a dream and that means the, the, the outside um, the environment is reflecting our inner state. Yeah, it means that, but it also means that our inner state is expressing itself That's via it. the outside world. It's, it's a feedback loop. It's a reciprocal colorizing feedback loop where we have an agency where we have this enormous creative power. You see, that's what quantum physics is this pointing is at. The point. That we aren't passive observers, that, but we have this enormous creative power each and every moment. But you see, the, the, the source of Watiko, the mind virus, is that we are not in touch with our creative powers. We are these geniuses, each and every one of us. We're, we're these creative, you know, these, these total, you know, just have enormous creative power and agency, but to the extent we're not awake to it, we're holding it unconsciously in a way where our genius for invoking reality gets turned against us in such a way that we're, we're actually destroying ourselves. And when that gets writ large collectively, 
you see the world that we're living in today. That's, that's what's actually happening. So I'm pointing at that the solution to all of the world crises is for each and every one of us, because it starts on the individual with yes. each one of us, to the extent that any of us, we connect with our creative power and genius. That's the very, that's where the solution is to be found. And then the next step, when one person does that, okay, that's great. It'll improve their lives a lot. But then when you hook up with other people who are also awakening to that and are plugging into the collective genius and are having the realization we can hang out together in a way where we all support and empower each other's awakening, that it's not a competitive sport, you know, who's more awake, you or me. But if I help, you know, with you, that helps me because we're not separate. You see, what all this is about, the whole thing about Watiko disease is that it has to do with identifying yourself in this limited way and you then become caught by this limited identity of the separate self that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and that you are actually colluding and creating each and every moment and then being a dream you're going to draw the evidence confirming that is who you are and that's a form of madness that's what watiko is but when we begin to actually snap out of that self-created spell and snap out of the the that 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 kind of fiction that we exist as a separate self and recognize we exist actually we're interdependent we're interconnected that's where we can actually access this enormous power to change the dream and that's not the, that's not just theory that's actually what's being not only is it being offered to us it's being demanded of us or we're not going to make it it's being demanded us as of us as an evolutionary leap mm -hmm. right right and one thing about the evolutionary leap the thing about the Watiko, you know, sort of disease, because it's a collective psychosis, instead of like when you have like a bug and it, it'll, you know, transform and do a mutation to, you know, to become, you know, sort of to, to not, you know, we develop medicine and it mutates right. to protect itself. Watiko doesn't do that. It forces us to mutate. It forces us to evolve. It's a That's negative okay. mutation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like it's the sort of thing, if Watiko didn't exist, we would have to create it. It's actually helping the evolution of the species. You see, the thing about Watiko, it's a quantum phenomena. And what that means is that encoded in the bug is, it, it, it's, it's, you know, are the two opposites. Or it's like the source of the greatest evil. It can take us down and destroy us. Or it can actually help us to wake up. And how it <laughs> manifests as, you know, the evil or the medicine it depends on if we have the recognition, what it's showing us. That's what my whole work is about, is basically saying what's happening in the world is a, is a dreaming process, just like a dream. It's speaking symbolically. That's the language of dreams. It's actually showing us something about ourselves. And just like a dream, if you don't get the message, you'll have just recurring dreams more and more in more and more amplified forms of the nightmare until you finally get the message. So I'm basically saying, hey, if we look at it, this way, we'll actually get the message and we'll begin to wake up. And that that's going to help everyone. I'm wondering, Paul, you know, the name of your website is Awaken in the Dream. Right. And we've used the word awaken here now, all of us, about 25,000 times. Right. Um, <laughs> what, what really, and I, I know we all have our different versions of this, but what does awaken mean to you? Waking up, what right. does it mean to you? Right, so I had this experience and it was based on my trauma in 1981. I was in such deep, the suffering was incredible that I had an awakening, quote unquote. And one way to describe it was that, oh, I began to have the realization that this, this world is a dream. Not that it's like a metaphor, it's not a metaphor. It's not, oh, it's like a dream. No, this world is nothing other than a dream. And just like when you have a dream at night, in a dream at night, if you don't, if, if you're not awake to the nature of, of your circumstance, you're going to think you're inhabiting this world that's solid and separate and objective from yourself. And then if you have, you know, if you actually have the recognition, oh, I'm in a dream, I had this, this lucidity at that moment, all of a sudden, you know, that's where you can, you know, really step into the dream. 
and, and um, transform the dream, transform yourself and evolve in that dream. So what that's, that's with, you know, at night when we have a dream, I'm saying that the same thing is available to us in this collectively shared dream that any of us can have the recognition, oh my God, we are actually inside of our psyche. That instead of being out of our minds, yes. we're, in, we're in our minds. And what that means is that you guys are like these, these dream characters of, of mine, and I'm a dream character of yours. And what is a dream like when you have a dream and you wake up at night, you know, in the morning and you think about the dream, oh, what part of myself was Andrew and Carolyn? Was that another part of myself? You know, they're, they're embodied reflective aspects of parts of the dreamer, you know? And if I can just like one way of really understanding the profundity of what's available to us is to contemplate, okay, to step into the dream via the imagination. So say we're having a dream and whatever we're perceiving, right, is just this reflection of, of our psyche because what is the dream but a, an outpicturing, it's, it's a reflection of our mind, okay? So if we're holding a perspective in that dream, the dream, which is nothing other than our mind, has no choice but to just reflect back that perspective. Well, the thing which is interesting, just contemplate that. So all of a sudden, you're holding a viewpoint, here the dream is offering you all the evidence, confirming that viewpoint, because it's just a reflection. And of course, what are you, how are you gonna interpret that? You're gonna interpret that, well, I'm seeing what's objectively there. And so the more, because you have the, the evidence, so the, and then you become fixed in that viewpoint. And the more fixed in that viewpoint you become, well, what's the dream gonna do? It has no choice but to just offer you even more evidence confirming the you know, reality of your viewpoint. So you're convinced you're seeing objective reality and the more evidence it gives you, the more you become fixed in that viewpoint ad infinitum. It's a feedback loop whose origin is your own mind. And if you take a look at what I just described in that dream, you can easily convince yourself that you're seeing objective reality. Absolutely. That, oh no, it's nothing to do. I'm not, I, I'm just a passive observer. Right. What I'm describing, that's what quantum physics blew the cover on. Quantum physics comes along and says, hey, if you think that this, is, you know, this is objective, you're out of your mind. This is dreamlike. Quantum physics has discovered empirically proven <laughs> that this is a collectively shared dream. That's what, that's what, that's why I wrote that book. And, and so when you see that, you realize, oh my God, each of us has in us this innate, you know, this intelligence, this genius for how we actually mold and forge and create reality. But when we're not awake to that, it gets turned against us in a way that's killing us. And you know this too from your Tibetan Buddhist affiliation. Right. Because as you, I don't have to tell you, but I've been initiated into Mayana Buddhism and you're taught from the very beginning that the divine figures that you're meditating on are emanations of your own mind and that all right. the practices are to grow your sense of the vast power of your own mind. So right. you chose to be a Tibetan Buddhist and the Tibetan Buddhists discovered this thousand years ago, didn't they? Right. Buddhism itself discovered it, but they evolved the techniques for yeah, yeah, yeah. working compassionately in the dream to transform the dream. Well, and the thing, one way that I love to describe Tibetan Buddhism, because I've been, you know, doing the practice for, you know, a long time since the early 80s. Um, and that is, you know, um, being a dream, what is a dream? But it's like this, this it's like the mind projecting itself out. It's a projection of the mind. And when we project onto the inkblot of the waking dream, when we typically project, it creates sort of like being separate from other people, being separate from the world, because we're not seeing the world, we're seeing you know, just our own projection. And so we're not actually in relationship to the world. So what Tibetan Buddhism did, it says, hey, we all project, we're projecting 24 seven. Why don't we access that projective tendency of the mind consciously in a way that's actually gonna help us to remember. So in, instead of it creating separation, it actually will help us 
to remember who we've always been. So yeah, we, you know, on the screen of our consciousness, we actually, you know, create this, 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 this image, like, you know, we actually have the projection of the deity, which is our higher self or God or Jesus or Buddha, whatever the symbol that speaks to your soul. And you're first in relationship to it and praying to it and receiving grace and blessings. And then you step into the image. Then right, you right. actually, you, you know, melt into it. Actually. You melt into yeah. it. You take on the pride of the deity. And if right. the deity has a body of light, not a solid fleshy body, but a body of light, you have that body of light. And you, you know, and you're just, you know, all of a sudden, all the blessings you've received, you're just radiating out to, to the whole universe. And the whole thing is your creative imagination. But Buddhism is saying, but every moment your experience is a function of your creative imagination. That's what quantum physics is pointing at. And being that that's so, why not plug into that consciously in a way that's going to help both you and others? And the expression of that realization of when you actually have the, the, the understanding, the experiential you know, insight into the dreamlike nature is compassion. Exactly. That's our nature. That's our true nature. So, Paul, you're speaking about helping people. Um, and I know that you not only practice Buddhism, but I believe you have groups, you teach people, mm -hmm. and you've written this vast uh, treasure house of books. Um, and, and you're a therapist, I believe, as well. So. No, no, not, not, I'm not, I'm, I can't call my, like, you know, no, I don't have any, you know, okay. any graduate okay. degree, but I have a lot of therapists who study with me. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So therapists study with you, you write books, uh, you have some other kinds of groups. Right. Okay. Anything oh, else? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, well, and the thing with the groups, they're not just ordinary groups. It's not just like a group therapy or like, right. oh, you no, know, no, it's it's a group. So a whole community in Portland, Oregon, where I am, is formed around my work. And I've been doing these groups for over 25 years. And it's basically, um, you know, bringing people together who are awakening to the dreamlike nature. And instead of that just being a theory, what if we were to really step into wow. step into the dream? So, you know, I have like, you know, I have one tomorrow night and the night after that and that and the night after that. Um, you know, three, three groups every week, and then I have one that's once a month. And um, you know, when people are in the groups for over 20 years, some of the average tenure of the groups might be 12 years, each person in the group for a weekly group. And, you know, they're all healers and shamans and therapists and artists, people who've really done their work and who have experience of, oh, this being a collectively shared dream. And what about if you bring people like that together and get to hang out without any agenda other than just to explore what, if this is a dream, what if we were to step into that? What would that show us? What would that look like? And it is, I mean, it's an evolutionary thing. I mean, and it's available to all of us. You know, I've been trying to get this out to people for years. I remember, Andrew, you and I went for a walk in the, in the woods at the monastery. And that was way back when. And I was trying to explain to you, I'm doing this thing. With I remember very room. well. And I didn't get it at the time because I right. was so infuriated by the Advaita Vedantin's dismissal of reality. And I didn't get the profundity of what you're saying, because you're not saying that it is unreal, because reality, the terror and horror that we're living in is appallingly real. Yes, it's but real. you're saying real. that the no. very real itself is a dream. Right, right. right. And, no, and that there's a way and that there's a long way. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that really clearly because I remember being frustrated because like, I was wanting to like, you know, transmit yes. this thing that I, that I had created. And then, you know, so just fast forward, here it is like 25 years later, you know, when I'm still doing the groups and, and you know, it's getting out all over the place. And, um, but, it, you know, what the point is, is that it, it's not just something that I'm doing. It's something that's, that's, that's available for all of us. There is a way of hanging out where, you know, say the three of us right now can be a group and say, if all of a sudden, wow, what you just said, Andrew, it really triggered me. Well, instead of in the normal, you know, day-to-day -day life, if you trigger me, oh, you're the problem. And oh, if you would only not do that, I, would, I wouldn't be triggered. It's like, no, if you trigger me, wow, what an incredible, great thing. Get, what, a what, an opportunity. what in me yes. is being triggered and, and all of a sudden, instead of putting my attention out on you, I'm actually putting my attention back on myself. You see, because what, what Tico does 
it, it, it influences where we place our attention so that we think the problem is outside of ourselves. And then as soon as we think, oh, the problem is this politician or that external thing, then Watiko just has a feast because it goes unseen. But when wow. we actually trace it back to ourselves, you know, because if like, okay, here, here's the, the most amazing thing about Watiko. It's an inner disease of the soul, right? Yes. It's yes. a psycho-spiritual disease of the soul, but somehow it has the magical ability to extend itself out into the world and seemingly configure outside events so as to synchronistically reflect the state of a psyche that's under its thrall. Okay, so that's really interesting because what that means is that, wait, so what's happening in the, in the outer dimension of our experience in the world is actually reflecting what's actually happening in me in, in, a, in this you know, synchronistic way. Wait a second, that's a description of a dream. You see, because when you see, there are three ways to see Watiko because it operates through, it's, it's, it operates through the, the parts of us that are asleep. If, if I have this, you know, part, oh, I'm unconscious of something, I have, you know, whatever, like, like, um, you see, the thing about Watiko, it's this blindness, it's a psychic form of blindness. When we have the blind spot, that's how Watiko comes in through, you know, through us. And so once you begin to see it, all of a sudden, it has no power over you. Right, and right. but to see it means if you think somebody out there has Watiko, oh, so and so, Mr. President, has Watiko, and I don't. That point of view of being polarized that is Watiko, and that is Watiko, right? <laughs> so the idea is, if you see somebody out there embodying Watiko, and you recognize that's reflecting that unconscious part of me, then you're beginning to wake up into the spell Watiko. So um, there's three three of the of these um, sort of aspects of how you see Watiko. First is to see this is a dream. When you recognize the dreamlike nature, oh yeah, we're dream characters. We're not separate. That leads into the second way to see through the illusion of the separate self. And then the third way, and all three are connected. They're not separate. Is the field, the non-local field in physics, that we are contained within the non-local field. And we're expressions of the non-local field. And to see that is to snap out of this imagination that we exist in a separate way. And to actually have that recognition, that's to, rec that's to recognize that we're interdependent and interconnected. <laughs> to step into our true identity and the expression of that, like we were saying, is compassion, is love. And that's the, the, that's the medicine. And we wouldn't have recognized, we wouldn't have gotten to that place without Watiko. So that's what I mean, that it's actually a catalyst to help us to connect with who we are. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question about our collective, our collective reality. <laughs> uh, we have just lived through, and we're not done yet, um, four years of complete madness and Watiko out in front of us that is a reflection mm -hmm. of us. Right. Um, that has left us with a division and um, a sense of hatred of fact that right. is, is absolutely, I think, uh, as, as severe a virus mentally as Corona is physically. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. And do you, see, um, do you see any of that shifting or what's your take? Well, on yeah, and it's very, it's a quantum situation. And what I mean by that is that it exists in, in a state of, you know, possibility of potentiality, because when there's such a disassociation, you know, both in the individual psyche and collective psyche, and there's the polarization, you know, like our, our body politic has never been more polarized. From the dreaming point of view, that means that something is potentially giving birth. Through that, you know, and, and that's where, you know, it, it enter, you know, with, with the whole dark night of the soul. It, well, are we going to successfully accomplish that birth? And we are the being that's, that's birthing. We're the one who's dying and we're the midwife for all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean, that it's all in a state of, of potentiality. And um, that's why you see, it's so important to not concretize our situation because being like a dream, this is in a very fluid state. And by our immense power that we have, if we concretize 
this world as being really, you know, doom and gloom and, and all that, then we're unwittingly colluding in creating the very destruction that we're reacting against. And but you yeah, do have to name the horror and the destruction, and you do it as brilliantly as anybody. You name exactly what's going on because you, for you, you you studied Wetiko like an ornithologist study birds. You understand how it moves, yeah, and you understand yeah. how devastating it potentially well, that's is. The big, my, the big, the, you know, the big mistake, Andrew, is that because I have a lot of friends, these 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 new age people who, you know, are incredibly beautiful people, good-hearted, well-intentioned, very, you know, intelligent, and they don't want to, they don't want to, like, put their attention on the darkness, and they're avoiding it, and I try to point out, well, what Tico actually gets fed by our turning this blind eye to it, in our avoidance, we're avoiding relationship with a part of ourselves, um, so, you know, and so many of these fairy tales talk about when there's a demon, you have to name it, that's you know, it. And by by finding the right name, and you know, the thing with with Watiko, that's just one name. It doesn't make a difference what the name is. It just has to be the right name, you know, the proper name for that demon. Because all all mythologies point out when you find the name of the offending demon, it takes away its power and it empowers you. So that's why it's so important you know to actually um to to speak the name to find the name you know for you know the, for evil because evil i'm not a you know i'm not talking in a theological sense i'm just talking in the psychological sense it's as real as we are people who think oh no evil isn't real well are you blind i mean just look around what's playing out on every scale <laughs> you know and so i'm pointing out that and like I'm saying, it really saddens me that some of these really beautiful spiritual people, oh no, 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 I don't want to place my attention on evil because that'll feed it. Well, yeah, on one level that'll feed it, but it'll more feed it by you avoiding it. But when you see how Watika works and you see the evil in the world and you see how it operates within your own minds by your unconscious reactions to the evil out there, then you, when you see Watiko, then as a sovereign being, you have a choice of, of right. okay, where I'm going to place my attention. And now that I see you, I don't want to become overly fascinated with, with evil. Now I want to invest my attention in creating the world I want to live in. And that, that you know, the thing what, about Watiko, it can't stand that because it, <laughs> yes. it feeds off of our attention. I once met an exorcist on a train. And we had the most fascinating conversation. And he said, the one thing the demon cannot stand is either being ignored or being laughed at. Right. So fundamentally, right. the New Ages are cowards. They don't really believe in their divinity because if they did, they would know they were strong enough to face anything about themselves and about human nature. They would be so grounded in truth. Well, that, that they wouldn't be. that's exactly it. And I talk right. about that in my work that, you know, if we're going to really have it out with Watiko, with evil, which we're fated to do, if we're not connected with who we are, with the higher self, then we don't stand a chance. Not but a chance. That, higher, that higher self, that's not possessable by, by that evil force that's transcendent to it, that's already free and, and always pure, that's our nature. And what Tico is doing everything it can to distract us from that, to forget that. But when you have exactly. to remember and really stabilize that realization, then, then what Tico can't get any, any you know, toehold in you at all. You know, but one other thing I keep, because I haven't said that there's so many things. I mean, we can talk for hours. There are so many things that, that I want to share. But one of the most important things is the profound importance of accessing being creative. Yes. yes. You know, and I can talk from my own experience because the thing about Watiko, it's this daimonic energy and daimon, the daimon is the inner voice and the guiding spirit. It has to do with the angel and with mm -hmm. you know um, finding your calling and, and your mission your to do your mission exactly all those things and the thing about watiko being this this daimonic energy it can possess a, a person or a group of people or a collective you know um group of people 
And, and then we just become unwittingly its instruments to compulsively act it out. Um, now, the thing about um, this, this Watiko being a daimonic energy, the daimon also, you see, if you don't, if you're not in conscious relationship to that daimon, the inner voice guiding spirit, it consolates negatively and becomes a demon. Okay. Right. And encoded in that daimon is the creative spirit. Right. So what I'm basically saying is that unless we connect with our creative voice, and you know, and it's just what Christ says in the apocryphal text. You know, you're so familiar. If you bring forth what's within you, it'll save you. If you don't bring forth what's within you, it'll destroy you. It's yeah. that idea that, and I'm speaking out of my own personal experience. When I had my my unmediated direct confrontation with archetypal evil with Watiko, you know, and I got a transfusion of it in my very soul, and it made me wow. sick for years. That if I wasn't able to connect with the creative spirit in me. I mean, I would have been, I don't even want to think about what would have happened to me. But, you know, connecting with the creative spirit, that's informed my books and my work, and it's helping people all over the world. And that's the idea of like the healer who has this, this, you know, the, the wounded healer, which is the shaman, and we're all wounded healers in training. And the idea being <laughs> is through our wound, it's by holding that wound in a certain way where we're not just avoiding it or dissociating you know, or identifying with it, but we're actually consciously just carrying it in a way that becomes the portal to our gifts. And that's really the figure, the archetype of the wounded healer, the shaman, the artist, the storyteller, that's who the we sacred are. Sacred activist. Yeah, exactly, sacred activism. Because that's exactly. creativity at the highest. Imagine sacred activism with the vision of the transfiguration process that we lay out in radical regeneration, with the vision that you've laid out so brilliantly in quantum physics and in your Watiko work. Imagine if sacred activists were trained in those and given the meditative tools of the refined Buddhist oh, tools right. and the other mystical tools. Then right. sacred activism would become creative at a level that it hasn't even begun to glimpse yet. Right, right. And it would be directly transformative of reality. Yeah, yeah. And, and just because your idea of like the, the sacred activism is so profound in the sense that, um, you know, people, you know, these spiritual people who think, no, I don't want to, I don't want to engage in the body politic because I'm too busy oh, meditating God. and doing my mantras. And I would point out to them, but your inner process being like a dream is manifesting as the outer world, which means that the way to actually integrate your inner process is to engage actively in the right. world, that the two aren't separate, Right. you know? Yeah. Carolyn, have you got a last question, my darling? What's it's wonderful to have you, Paul. We could speak with you for the next. I know, very, but this could fun. go on forever and ever, and I hope yeah. it will one day it, soon. Yeah, totally. It is. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't really have any more questions. I I just want to tell you how much I've appreciated what you have to say about quantum physics, and it's inspired me to read more about quantum physics. And one of the things that's so amazing to me, and, and I just love it, it's almost like going to church, is, uh, you know, how these quantum physics physicists speak of the ultimate reality, how they speak of the sacred, of the divine, without using those words, um, because it's changed them completely. I mean, my God, look at Einstein. Um, right. Just look at the, uh, the way they have integrated the spiritual and the physical uh, because of their research. And uh, so right. you've put, yeah, me, uh, you've put yeah. me on the path of exploring more. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And, okay. and the thing with Einstein, I mean, he was one of the founding fathers, but he actually couldn't embrace no. uh, the full right. reality. The because full quirkiness he, of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was, you know, he was still attached to that there was an objective world. And yeah. he, you know, he couldn't quite let go of that idea. It was just an idea, but it was clear from his, from his work, he wasn't able to let go of that because to let go of that is to really, is this fully step into the dream. And like, I guess one final thing that I want to add about the quantum physics idea or, you know, the insights that are emerging, which is just, it's so psychedelic, is that when you have the, the realization, like quantum physics is pointing out that there's no objective world, and that, okay, there's no objective world, 
the act of me observing the world is influencing the world observed. So therefore my act of observation is creative. Therefore the world is like a dream. Well, what that means, the implication of that is that if there's no objective, you know, anything really, um, whether it be things or people or this universe out there, there's nothing objective. All of a sudden, what about the subject? Because right, I, right. as a subject, I, I have to have an object to be in relationship to in order to be a subject, in order to be a separate self. If all of a sudden there's no object, then wait a second, what happened to the subject? So all of a sudden quantum physics is promoting itself to be a spiritual path because it's flooding light on who we are. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And, and that, Carolyn, I think is what you're pointing at. Yes. That yes. these founding fathers of quantum physics and even the current day quantum physicists, as they're wrapping, because they, they didn't sign up, you know, when they went to graduate school to become a scientist, this isn't what they signed up for. <laughs> oh, no. They're like they're like <laughs> forced to wrap their mind around, around what they're what they're realizing, yeah. which has to do well, with it, it actually, our nature. It actually caused them to have nervous breakdowns, didn't yes, it? Yeah. Right. And be terrified right. because yeah. the and revelation exactly. of emptiness is, which is fundamentally what con a fecund paradoxical emptiness that creates everything. That's what quantum physics is, how quantum physics and Tibetan Buddhism are so aligned, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think of the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. You right. Know? And the idea being that, you know, this, this, this world is emptiness itself appearing in the form of form, but it's not separate from the emptiness. It's nature is empty. There's nothing, there's no physical substructure. That's what quantum physics discovered. It right. actually plugged into the Buddha's realization of the empty nature of phenomena and the empty nature of ourselves and the empty nature of our mind. That's what it, it, it basically, from the scientific point of view, it plugged into the same realization that the Buddha had. And, and I, we're looking at this marriage potentially in the future of the deepest mystical wisdom with the highest scientific discoveries of the quantum field. And I've been working on a project called The Field, which I'd love to talk to you about between us, because if we can find a way of bringing people together with deepest mystical training and scientific openness and the intention to turn up as creative transformative agents in the dream, then we're potentially training the new species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly it because then bringing people together like that, it's a, it's a contagious thing where if somebody is in touch with their unconscious in a way, that you know, um, they're really just you know the permeability between their guidance and their ego. You know, they're continually just you know interfacing and in touch with themselves in that way. You know, I mean, you know, one very simple way to think about it: when you're hanging out with someone who's really you know has some form of creativity and awakening and you know and access to their unconscious, it like affects us when we hang out with people like that. We all of a sudden start feeling more inspired, more creative. Well, just imagine bringing people together like that who are plugging into the quantum, that who Absolutely. are having the realization that we're quantum activists and that and, and discovering we can dream ourselves awake, we can conspire to co-inspire each other. You talk about having, well, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist. Absolutely. That that's available, <laughs> that's available to us. We can we can activate the collective like intelligence in us in a way that we've only begun to imagine. That's right. available to us. That's what quantum physics is showing us. That it's completely available to us right now. It's not even like we have to think about that. In it's all here, but it's it's three things because we have here, we have the mystical systems, the highest wisdom of this fecund emptiness that we are one with. We have quantum physics discovering these astounding possibilities. And we now have a global technology that could interconnect us. Imagine what could happen through the bringing together right. of all of those. That's right, and that global technology until it's 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 channeled in a way that's going to be like helpful, it, it's potentially destroying us. Either Wetiko or the enlightened consciousness uses technology. It's a neutral tool. Right, right. It, it, it's exactly it. And that's the idea that really, that's what I'm pointing out when I say that Wetiko is a quantum phenomena that has encoded in, in, in the Wetiko virus. It's like the deepest evil that can destroy us. 
or it's the highest good and blessing that can awaken us. And how it manifests, being quantum, depends on how we observe it, how we dream it, if we recognize what it's showing us. It's, that's, that's really the bottom line. But it's more than how we observe it. It's how we take responsibility for being creators of the dream. Well, right. It's not just observing it in a passive way. Right. But then we're actually, you know, that's, this is quantum, quantum physics. We're participating in the invocation of our universe moment by moment. It's not just because you're right. Even the word observing, it sort of has a connotation of passive. But quantum physics is saying, no, we're not just passive observers of anything. We're active participants moment by moment. That's where we, so basically we entrance ourselves. We hypnotize ourselves by the actual creative power of our own minds. That's really the source of what you That's the source of the evil and the madness that's playing out and encoded in that energy is the, is the solution. I do have one more question, Paul. Um, speaking of the new age, you know, sometimes people in new age circles talk about you create your own reality. Right. And on a quantum level, um, that's true. And it also can be used to, well, you know, I want a new Ferrari. Right. So, you know, um, if I do all the right things, you know, I'll create this reality or uh, yeah. negatively, you know, yeah. I have cancer. So I right. created my own illness. Right. Can you and say then you more about all of that? It. Right. Sure. Yeah. That triggers me to no end when, because, you know, on one hand, there is intelligence to that. But then I would say, OK, great. Who's the you who's creating that? Right. Show me, show me that you, you know, yeah, yeah. because they're, un, you know, undoubtedly they're identified with this reference point in space and time, you know, the, the illusion of the separate self. And That's if they're right. wanting like a Cadillac or a Rolls Royce or whatever, yeah, they're, of course, let's, the law of attraction, let's just dream up physical stuff where that's not the point. The point is to get in touch with who we actually are and who yeah. we actually are is not the separate self. Yes, but you know, that 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 authentic self that's actually not separate. Like well, one one you know a very beautiful way of understanding this. So mm -hmm. when I get in touch with my authentic self, I have the realization: oh well, I don't exist. You know, in this in this like you know as this separate self, separate from anybody else. I'm only existing. I have a relationship with with all of you, with to mm -hmm. view with everyone, right? But think about okay i have a this like this a relationship to you but you don't exist as a separate self either you exist relative to someone else and they don't exist as a separate self they only exist relative to other people and the rest of the universe right. you can't find a reference point anywhere when right. you have the realization of that what you discover is that there's no separate self anywhere to be found. Right. Now, when you tap into that, how does that want to dream? Yeah. Does that want a yellow Cadillac or a Rolls Royce? Or does that want to actually get more in phase with itself and become congruent and right. actually experience its connectedness, which is its nature? And the expression of that realization is love and compassion. That's what I would say to those people. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate it. I really <laughs> loved our conversation. Oh, and totally. anybody listening, I just want to recommend that you read Paul Levy's amazing book, Quantum Revelation, and also Dispelling Wetiko. Yes. And watch out for the new book, which will be out soon. I hope in And the new title is, Paul, the title of the um, new see, Seeing Wetiko, Healing Our Mind Blindness. Thank you. Seeing what you go, healing our mind blindness, right? And that's, it, it, you know, I'm hoping that's going to be the final title. That's tentative, but I think it's a good enough title. I think it's a fabulous title. Do. Don't it's change well. your word. Congratulations. Right. right, totally. Yeah, and I just want to thank you guys so much. It's so fun just, you know, so lovely out. to see you again, Paul. I hope we have yeah. many chances to do this because there are many questions totally. I have to ask you and I'd love you to be part of this adventure that I've been cooking up. No, no I feel no, like we activate, the three of us just super activate each other. And that, <laughs> that's what it's all about, to of hang course. out with people who do that, yeah. you know, because then then we, we, can, we can change things. I mean, absolutely. And they can change very, very fast. Yes, they yeah. can. That yep. is what is also something that your book taught me, Quantum 
revelation right. because it is we're hung up part of where tico is to make us feel that things have to go gradually but in fact in evolution proceeds by convulsions and sometimes those convulsions are horrifically destructive and sometimes they throw up absolutely new combinations of forces right that's that's the way we're in. That, that is so right on when, when i was talking about having an awakening in 1981 you know which, which almost killed me and got me diagnosed oh you're just out of your mind and I told him that that's true, I was. But um, <laughs> that happened, that happened to me. That stuff, physically impossible stuff, that was absolutely impossible to happen in the third dimension was happening in that one moment I was in one universe and the next moment the whole universe had completely morphed. And it was, it was very destabilizing for my conscious ego. But over the years, as I've been contemplating it, I've more and more understood, oh, I see, I was beginning to, beginning to see the nature of reality. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you so thank much, you for your Paul. fantastic work. It's an yeah, honor. Totally. Guys, thank you so much, really. Thank really you for everything. It. We love yeah, you. God bless yeah. you. Love thank you. you. Everyone.